Okay. Hi, and welcome everyone. My name is Jamie. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And on behalf of the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery with the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, we are thrilled to present today's program as part of COLA 2022. As a public and civic institution, we acknowledge that our gallery resides on what was historically the homeland of Kits, Tongva, and Chumash peoples who were dispossessed of their land. We encourage you to share what land you are on today in the chat if you feel comfortable doing that. And before I introduce and hand it off to Danny, I have a few housekeeping bits to go over. The first is just uh, we ask that you please make sure your microphone is muted during the artist talk portion of the program. That way we prevent any feedback or any other inadvertent disruption. And as the Zoom mentioned at the start, uh, we are recording today's program um, just for archival purposes. And that way we make it uh, available uh, for folks who may not, may not otherwise have had the chance to join us today. And we will have time towards the end of the program for a Q&A with Danny. So if you have any questions or comments or, or whatnot, um, feel free to enter them in the chat or when we get to the Q&A portion, um, you're more than welcome to take yourself off mute and ask Danny directly, but um, just to use the, use the chat and we'll keep an eye on it. And uh, we'll, we're also really grateful to have the support of the Department on Disability for this program. Um, so we have sign language interpreters available, Nicole and Hillary, and uh, we also have uh, captioning um, being provided by Cindy here. So there's also my colleague, Stephanie, um, who just entered the live stream text in the chat if you'd like to access the live captioning that way, or you can enable that through Zoom right now. And um, with that, um, just it's uh, just on behalf of the gallery, again, it's been a true honor and pleasure to work with Danny and all of this year's COLA 2022 design and visual artists. Um, Danny has actually been featured in an exhibition at the gallery before in uh, the 2020 show Archive Machine. So it's always an incredible uh, pleasure to work with Danny and um, with the this new work that he'll be talking about today. It's just, it's truly just uh, inspirational. So we're super excited and thrilled to have Danny here to talk us through and share a little bit more about his work. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Danny. Thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to to Jamie and to Stephanie and to Department of Cultural Affairs and the LA, um, you know, Barnstall Municipal Gallery for this this incredible opportunity. It's really amazing to to be able to get this fellowship. I mean, it's so rare for a for a city kind of to be supporting artists directly in the way that COLA does. So I, I really kind of appreciate it. Um, what I what I uh, uh, what I thought I'd do with um, with the talk today, I think, in talking with Jamie, we thought. Well, how can we do this a little bit differently? And so what we, we what we came to was that I would show you the work that I created for COLA, but also um, talk to you a little bit about the research that goes on um, with the work and then a little bit of the process, given that that there's some technology involved. Um, so it'll be it'll be that kind of talk. So if you give me a, a one second, I will share my screen and then we can get started. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that? We, we good? All right. Um, so the series of work that, that I'm gonna um, uh, show you today is called Nunca Cerramos. So that's the, the title of, the, of the, uh, the images. So these are um, images that I created specifically for the COLA Fellowship. Um, and the, the, the main idea here, the kind of uh, thread throughout all of the images is that they are, um, images of um, what I call an imaginary artifacts. So these are our artifacts, um, uh, objects, relics, um, talismans that I invented and then using um, 
3D modeling software, so CGI, software that is used for video games and for special effects in movies. I um, digitally sculpted, um, uh, textured, uh, and then I brought them into a different program and lit them like they were still life objects and then photographed them, um, all using virtual cameras and lights um, and, um, and textures. So uh, what I'll go through is I'll go through a few of the images and then I'll kind of dive into a little bit of the research. Um, all of the images and objects that I created um, have some either loose or direct um, connection to queer spaces predominantly in Los Angeles. So this one, Tea Room Talisman, um, it's a bronze kind of talisman that is made um, out in the layout of a map of a, of a tea room, which is a, a public bathroom that um, is utilized um, by men for anonymous sex. So um, I decided to kind of light them and place them in, in these different um, locales that kind of um, either feel like they're in a museum or they could also feel like they're in a domestic space. So they, it goes in and out of these public and private spaces. Um, and here I was thinking a lot about the idea of um, archives and thinking about um, traditional archives are kind of centralized, right? So there's one location and, and, and it's the, you go to the collection and you know thinking that way. Um, but I was thinking, well, what would a queer archive be? Um, and so I thought that a queer archive would be decentralized, right? So it wouldn't be in one location. It would be, it would be decentralized and spread out and amorphous and um, unofficial in a lot of ways. So I think of, of the collection of images and then the locations that the objects are in as this sort of decentralized queer archive. Um, some of the images uh, that I created uh, have um, what I refer to as ritual objects, objects of ritual. So these are imaginary objects that I would, uh, that I kind of Im imagine would be used in a sort of ritual. Um, but again, they're all connected to different queer spaces in Los Angeles. So this one, and I, I will show you some of the references um, in a second, but this one is an, a bronze offering cup that is uh, connected to um, a bathhouse um, in Hollywood called the Hollywood Y Baths. Um, this one is, um, uh, I kind of modeled this one so that it would look like a, a, a miniature jade uh, sculpture of the Gay Club Arena. Um, so this is a, a club that was um, predominantly um, a Latinx queer club, um, especially in the 90s. Um, I remember going to Arena and when I was in high school. Um, it's no longer there. Uh, so I wanted to somehow pay tribute to, to this club. Um, and I created this, this jade artifact. But one of the things that I was really interested in in, in, in the work is that I think of what I'm doing as a, as a form of brujeria. So this, this type of like witchcraft uh, and that I'm bringing these um, objects from, from archives um, to life. So I'm kind of uh, um, conjuring them. So I wanted to imbue an object with that kind of uh, power. So in this case, I made, I made the object levitate so that um, it would suggest that, that, that the object itself has this, um, this inner power um, and that we're, you know, it's photographed in, in this moment. And here I'm really kind of playing with, with the possibility of the software. I mean, it's, it's 3D modeling software, so literally anything is possible. Um, so I, I, the most obvious thing for me was like, well, it could defy gravity. Um, because I can make anything in this in this three dimensional world, and and part of the reason why I was attracted to the modeling software is 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 that very thing strikes me as as incredibly queer. The idea that there's possibility, um, it's and it's an endless possibility. Um, that's that's something that I that I associate with queerness, and that it there's so much potential, um, in in an alternative world. Um, and this software is literally made to to build worlds. So I thought it was kind of a a really beautiful um, um, marriage of the of the subject with the technology. Um, so this one kind of gives you a little bit more sense of a museological or an archive, a traditional kind of setting. 
um, where uh, we have the, the marble tablet, and this one is related to Hyperion Baths, um, a bathhouse um, in Silver Lake that's no longer there. Um, another image that is, is within that kind of museum space, um, Copper Lantern, 5032 Sunset Boulevard. Um, so one of the things that, that runs through all of the work is that almost all of them are connected to actual um, archival documents that I find um, either in public uh, archives or that I have in my own personal collection. Um, uh, a majority of these are, are, are coming from um, one archive. So one archives is the archives at USC. It's the, the largest um, gay and lesbian archive um, in the world. And that's where I discovered um, Bob Damron's The Address Book. So I've done work on this before and I'll kind of show you a little bit of that. But uh, Bob Damron's Address Book was a secret gay guide guidebook that was developed by Bob Damron Damron in 1965. So it was a little book that listed um, gay bars and restaurants, safe spaces for men to meet. Um, and he published one every single year and it included spaces in every city. Um, one Archives has an entire collection, uh, one booklet from every year. Um, and in this particular one, I forget what year this one is. I think it's in the, um, I think this is like a 70s one, but whoever owned this book, um, crossed out the, the addresses of the spaces that were no longer there. And most of my work has always been about erasure, about um, uh, gentrification and, and the loss of, of gay spaces in Los Angeles in particular. So that line, that crossing out line was, was such a, a beautiful and poignant uh, metaphor for, for all of the work that, that I had been doing. Um, and I decided to, to just make it into a tablet here. So on the left, you can see the image that I shot at one archives of the book. And then on the right, you can see how I'm connecting it directly to the tablet. So I'm literally imposing it onto uh, this, this tablet and then um, making the lines red just so that it, it highlights them. Um, so this is an image of, of the address book, the very first one, and it looks really big here, but it's really tiny. Um, and um, the idea of the address book was that in, their, in the first ones, pre-Stonewall, um, the address book did not have any mention of gay or queer, like there was not, none of that. It was all done in, in secret code and lingo because if you were caught with one of these, you um, if you were caught with any kind of gay paraphernalia, then you would be arrested. Um, so this was was done um, as a covert way that he would sort of sell individually. Um, and uh, again, he published it every year. In the 70s, post Stonewall, you start to see them uh, using um, more, oh, it, it becomes more overt. So it's, you know, uh, images of men and, and it's gay this and gay that because it became safer to do so. Um, I've utilized uh, archives before and, and specifically um, uh, the Damron guides in previous work. So this is uh, an animation uh, from 2016 that uses some of the advertisements. Um, in, in, in this, in this uh, animation, uh, a, a line of erasure sort of erases uh, the advertisement, but I've stacked them digitally. So when you erase one, it reveals another. And this is sort of a, I was thinking metaphorically as an attempt to counter the erasure by insisting that one be there. But ultimately that it, it ends up becoming this, this web of images that, that then you can't really decipher anything. So it's, it's about a futility to, to kind of um, counter that erasure. Um, in 2018, I did another, another um, uh, uh, animation. Uh, I think this was the one that was in the archive machines uh, of the actual Damron guides. And then um, the biggest project that I did with the Damron guides was um, this website, Disguised Ruins, where I digitally um, input every single address in the Los Angeles section of the Damron guides and then mapped the opening and closing of those spaces. Um, so this is a, an animated map that that uh, every for however long the the ad address shows up in the in the guidebook, a kind of white dot appears glowing. And then when it 
when it doesn't show up in the guidebooks anymore, it reveals. So you really start, you kind of see the rise and the fall of these gay spaces, and they and it kind of directly correlates with um, the rise of um, the gay rights movement and then um, the AIDS crisis. Because as soon as the AIDS crisis hits um, in the 80s, um, uh, mid 80s, you start to see the decline of these spaces on the map. So it goes from really, really bright and effervescent to kind of dark. Um, so I'd been doing this, this work with these archives in the past, um, and I wasn't really satisfied with, I knew that there was more that I could use, I, there's more that I could do specifically with the advertisements and with all these documents that I had been collecting. But I, I, I was struggling to find ways that, that, that felt fulfilling in, in how to um, um, put them together. I was simultaneously uh, obsessively reading archaeology magazine just like randomly um, and uh, I just love that magazine and um, it just one of those days it's one of those things that was just in the studio where I just thought oh I can just put these two things together um, and um, and combine the advertisements with the kind of artifacts that I've been seeing in archaeology magazine um, together and then it just everything kind of just made sense. Um, so it opened up a whole new kind of way of working for me. I, I um, my, my training is in photography, but for the last couple of years I'd been doing mostly drawing and painting and it's only been in the last five years that I've been really exploring um, digital media, but I did not know the software. I was actually learning the software um, primarily so that I could teach it, um, not really intending to use it in my own art artwork, but I think my mind was just within that sphere and then it, it just a lot of things clicked together. So here on the left, you can see the uh, Hyperion bath and you can see on the right the uh, an image from the advertisement um, that uh, you can see the the correlation there between the images. Um, this is the Hollywood, Hollywood Y baths. Um, this is the offering cup that I, I used and created this, this ritual object um, uh, and made it look like bronze, but obviously copying the figure um, in, in the advertisement. Um, in addition to, to the Damron guides, there's other documents that I found at one. Um, this um, these in particular really interested me because um, I'm really interested in mapping, um, especially the idea of or the concept of counter mapping. So the, uh, this notion of um, uh, mapping unofficial data onto onto maps or using maps as a as a um, as a object of protest. Uh, so um, these are I found out one archives and just sort of became obsessed with. Um, these are um, observation sheets that um, a sociologist named Laud Humphreys created in 1965. Um, these were what he used to eventually publish um, his book, Tea Room Trade, um, Impersonal Sex in Public Places. And what it is, is that he would go into these tea rooms, which again are public restrooms that men use for anonymous sex. And he kind of infiltrated these spaces and started observing um, the, the movements and rituals really of how men would engage um, in anonymous sex. And he would create these maps um, that mapped out the kind of, you know, um, the movement. Um, the way he was able to get away with it is that uh, he quickly realized that, that uh, different men play different roles within, within that sphere. And one of the roles is that of what, what was known at the time as the watch queen. And the watch queen is someone who is a, a voyeur, so a, a passive participant who just watches, um, not only watches the kind of action that's happening in, in the tea room, but also then watches out to make sure that, that other people don't come in or that the cops don't come in. So he played the role of the watch queen and that was the way he was able to sort of um, get away with doing this. I'm working on a whole other project that's related to this, but, um, but just so that you can see that I, I, I'm not just relying on the Damron guides, I'm also using other documents that I find in the archives. And that's what um, Tea Room Talisman is based off of. It's based off of the map of the public um, tea rooms that um, Lud Humphreys um, created. 
This is another um, advertisement. And in this one, I'm also starting to do something that I'm really excited about um, where I am taking the advertisements that I find or even just regular documents that I find in, um, in, the, in at one. And then what I'm doing is I'm translating them into Spanish. Um, and this is one way of, um, I think of this as sort of addressing the missing subject um, in, in, in archives um, and thinking about um, address, addressing um, a Latinx subject that I think is um, not missing at one archives because they definitely do have, um, um, you know, Latinx um, objects, but it's definitely uh, uh, predominantly white. Um, and and thinking about how we tell a history where where we're in Los Angeles, how do we center then Latinx queers? Um, and because I was inventing objects, I, I that was exciting because then I thought, well, that gives me liberty um, to do anything really. I don't. There's no fidelity that I have to um, stick to, right? So I started um, translating some of the the the, the advertisements. And then in some cases, just com completely creating copy altogether on, on my own. So this one is um, on, you know, on the left says fun for all. And, and this one, it's kind of hard to read, but it's translated to um, aquí disfrutamos todos, um, and which is, you know, same, like we all, we all have fun here. And then the, the copy that I added here is, um, it says, come for the heated pool, stay for the puteria. So it's using Spanglish. Um, which is usually the way that I use um, Spanish, um, unless I'm speaking to my parents and then I use my very bad broken Spanish. But if I'm using Spanish in my day to day, it's, it's in Spanglish. Um, so this was just kind of my attempt to, to, um, to um, address Latinx queers and, and kind of our history within, within this city. Um, and so the title of the, of the, the, the body of work is, is called Nunca Cerramos, which is taken from an advertisement uh, for a bathhouse and literally their tagline is we never close. Um, so uh, Nunca Cerramos translates to we never close, which again, I just thought was such a perfect phrase for, for this entire body of work given that, that they all are closed, right? Um, so it, it's, it's, that was part, part of that um, idea here. Um, and then, one uh, something else that I'm doing in, in some of the images, uh, like I mentioned before, is some I'm placing in kind of museum spaces, but then others I'm 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 doing um, what I think of as sort of like a type of repatriation. So thinking about placing these objects back into the queer spaces or gay spaces. So in this particular case, um, using the dance floor of a club as a stage, um, and thinking about the the display aesthetics of of clubs um, and bars and kind of scrambling that with um, a kind of museological archive. So I kind of think of this as, uh, you know, leaned up against against the wall of a dance floor um, so that the lights of the of the club can can um, sporadically um, hit it and thinking here about like makeshift memorials, thinking about the, the way that that makeshift memorials happens kind of spontaneously and in, um, in 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 unofficial spaces, right? So here I'm, I'm playing with, with, that, with that last tablet that you just saw. Um, and the other element of the work that, that I was also really drawn to is, is trying to make these look almost like ancient, uh, in some cases, tablets um, um, or uh, bronze objects. I was doing a lot of research on like Mayan jade objects. Um, and that's kind of the aesthetic that I'm trying to mimic here with with the with the um, with some of the, the tablets, and this really all started um, when I again in Archaeology magazine um, started discovering these images that I'm just completely obsessed with and still completely obsessed with. I just think they're so beautiful, and these are uh, lidar scans. So this is a type of uh, a scan scanning that sends out um, uh, some sort of, I don't really understand how it works, but it sends out some sort of signal and then that signal bounces back and it can measure the distance between how long it took for it to bounce back. 
I think most of our iPhones and newer iPhones now have this technology actually. So you can do 3D scanning with, with them with that same technology. Um, but these are um, these are satellite images that were taken of Mayan ruins. And I just thought that they were just the most beautiful things. Um, and I love the idea that the technology is, is useful in this case because it can see through the jungle. So it's literally all of these things are buried underneath uh, the jungle and um, the, the technology is allowing them to see the kind of invisible. And as a metaphor and an analogy, I thought that was so kind of um, right up my alley. Um, and again, for the longest time, I was trying to figure out, well, I want to do something with this, um, but I could never really quite figure out what to do. But this is where this all started. So that just kind of going not in, in chronological order, but this is where kind of this exploration really, really started is in thinking about these satellite images um, and um, how I can bring some of these uh, kind of poetic metaphors um, to the work. Um, one of the works that I, I created for Archive Machines was actually the very, very first early attempt um, at doing that. So this is the very first um, digital attempt that I did where I'm using the digital software to um, sculpt and try to create a map that looked very similar to these. I mean, this is sort of what I was trying to do um, in, in this uh, Watch Queen map. Um, this is when I was very, very, very uh, uh, first learning the software. Um, uh, I think my skills have improved a lot since then, but still you can see, I think the connection between um, um, the source images and then how I'm combining them with archival documents. And that's kind of what really led to, to the Nunca Saramo's work. Um, Tablets are, are another, were another kind of source of inspiration for me, different types of ancient tablets. And in particular, I, I like the way that, that um, tablets had missing parts. And that seemed really important to me that it wasn't the, the totality of the tablet, that it were these missing parts. Um, and um, in some museums, um, they, they repair the tablet and put a blank kind of piece in the corner so that you can see the whole shape. And I always thought that was really beautiful as well in terms of, a, of an analogy. Um, these images are, are has, has the tablets incomplete. But you can see here the way that I'm, I'm this is an early, an early tablet that I, that I worked on that I, I didn't end up using. Um, but you can see that um, I'm taking the tablet and, and literally um, recreating it using digital software. So here I'm using Cinema 4D is the digital software that I'm using to, to sculpt these objects. And then that's what allows me then to superimpose. So this one, um, the tablet that you're seeing on the right has the, the watch queen uh, markings from the map kind of engraved into the tablet. And it's, that's what allows me to do some of the digital sculpting um, um, and the combination of the two. Um, but yeah, the, the software is, is really interesting. This is an image of the, of the actual um, tablet and it's, it's a mesh. It's, it's all, it's just um, geometry um, that then gets manipulated through using brushes and, and different tools. Um, but it's, it's quite literally um, a, a, a grid that then gets manipulated, you know, in, in all kinds of different ways to create it. Um, I wanted to kind of show you the, the process that I go through. Obviously, I kind of learned a lot of different software and then um, made some major leaps. Um, this, what I'm showing you right now, is basically like a progression of over like three or four years. Um, it's some of the software is ex extremely difficult um, to learn and it's taken, I, and I still, by the way, I only know like the very, very surface, like I've just scratched the surface on the software. But on the left hand side, you have the, um, the, the model that is um, uh, sculpted, digitally sculpted, um, with no texturing. So it's just sort of a white clay. Um, and on the right, it's the beginning phase of texturing. Um, and texturing is really interesting. I'll, I'll talk about it in a little, in a, in a little bit. But um, 
on the right, it's got the first layer of, of texturing on it. And you could already start to see um, how it starts to come to life a little bit in terms of, of looking like um, stone. Um, I'm using a software program called Substance Painter um, that then allows you to layer these images onto the tablet. And um, it, you can then, you, it's, it's utilizing what are called maps, uh, again, something that I just think it's so fascinating, um, which are really just images. They're, they're images, and in a lot of cases, they're actual photographs. So what you're seeing um, in this case here, this is an actual photograph of concrete or gravel that then gets sort of projected onto this three-dimensional object by the software. And that's what gives it the illusion of, um, of, of texture. Um, not all of them are, are actual photographs. Um, some of them are just images. Um, some of them are just direct paint. And on, on the right-hand side, you can see all the layers here. But it's basically just a process of layering, removing, um, adding different effects. Um, because it's utilizing maps, the software learns um, where there's a crevice and where there's something that kind of pokes out. And uh, when you add the paint and, and what, what have you, it, it responds to that. So here you can see that the, the indentations here are darker because that was like the dirt layer that then you can, you can manipulate how much dirt is inside of the cavities, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it takes the mesh, it reads the mesh, and then it allows you then to do whatever you want. Like I could turn this one into a jade object. I can turn it into whatever, as long as I have the images on the left-hand side or photographs and then to then put onto um, the, the object. And um, this is actually what it ends up producing. So these are what are called the texture maps. Um, and this is where I think it's really interesting in terms of um, photography. Because literally what it's doing is it's taking a photograph, um, in this case, the, a photograph of marble on the left hand side, projecting it onto um, the image. And then through the various texturing, it produces what are called texture maps. And these texture maps then get put onto the object layered. Um, and that's what then produces this three dimensional object that then responds to light. So on the left-hand side, I'm going a little into the weeds just because I think it's interesting. Um, on the left-hand side, this is the, the color map. So this is really just all the color information from the marble. Um, this is what's called the normal map. And in this map, they've, I don't know how it works, but the, the software learns to read some of these colors as light or dark. So when I'm using virtual lights, it responds to that light. So this is sort of like um, surface texture. And then this is what, what is called like a roughness map. And that, that um, determines how shiny or how dull certain areas of the image will be. And I can, I can control all of these things um, using this software program. So I'm doing all of that. And then what it spits out are these, um, these maps that then I bring into a third software program um, to then do what is called the rendering. So um, I'm showing you some of the like very, very, very bad early um, versions of this, just so that you can see the process. Um, on the left-hand side is what it looked like after I finished texturing it um, and rendering it using um, the software program that was used to texture it. And these are my early attempts to figure out, well, what do I do with this object now? I created this tablet. I hadn't quite figured out what to do with it yet. Um, and I thought, oh, well, maybe just on a blank background. And then I did that, and I was like, well, that's that's okay. It doesn't look that great. And then I thought, oh, right, I can just create these little, you know, still lives. Um, on the right hand side, you see the very first attempt at, at these images, and you can see there's all kinds of problems, right? Um, it's out of proportion. Uh, the texturing didn't translate correctly, so this one doesn't look like this one. Um, the lighting is all bad. Um, the 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 stand um, looks very artificial. So, but this was my first attempt, and this was like, okay, I think I can, I think I can get it to work. But now I've got to find the right software program for it. And at this point, I hadn't found it yet. Um, at this, in this phase, I moved on to the sec, to the third software program. Where I thought, okay, this is what I need to learn in order to make what I want. This is a program called Redshift that um, renders. So it takes all of the mesh, all of the the maps. Um, and it's what allows me to then light and photograph using virtual cameras um, and the composition. I can 
manipulate all of that. And I'm, so here I'm figuring out the lighting and figuring out, obviously you can see the proportions of the marble changes, I'm trying to figure out composition, but even still, there's still a lot of problems here. Like for instance, the where the marble meets the, the table um, kind of looks really fake. Um, uh, the pole, the little stand still looks really artificial. Um, it doesn't have a, um, a, lot, a lot of texture. So this is like, three, four months of trying to figure this out and, and, and slowly, slowly getting to the place um, where I finally go uh, here. So on the left-hand side is like here, I'm getting a little closer. I'm getting a little closer to kind of what I really want. And, uh, but there's still some problems, um, but generally speaking, it's like, I'm happy with, with this result. And then on the right-hand side is the final version that I've then refined the lighting. I've changed the, the texture from, from stone to marble. Um, I've changed the composition a little bit. You can see the scale of the, of the marble stand here has changed um, a little bit. The pole doesn't look as, as fake. Um, and again, I, I'm still like very, very amateur at, at this, but um, there's people that are just really, really good at it. Um, and then I just wanted you to see kind of what this looks like in, in, the, in the software. And this is what it looks like in the software. Um, so you can see the, um, the stone tablet here, the marble stand. Um, and then this is the kind of 3D world that it lives in. Here's the virtual camera. Um, these rectangles are the lights. So you can see that setup. So, so this setup here has um, one, two, three, four, five lights that then kind of light the whole thing. You can see that they're different, different sizes and different shapes. Um, but then that's what, what then I use to, to create all of the, the artifacts. It's been um, an incredibly difficult, uh, it's three different programs that I had to learn, um, but I have to say that it's been so much fun. It's like really, really fun. Um, I, I'm glad that I'm kind of reconnecting with my like photography roots, even though this is more, um, virtual photography, but it's, it's just a lot of fun. I can, I can spend hours, hours doing it. Um, so that's, that's what I've got for everybody. Um, and then I think that we, we have some time for some questions, right? Yes, thank you so much, Danny. Um, it's uh, it's it's always uh, just super fascinating to hear you uh, talk more about your, especially with this work and the process, and just even seeing that uh, that last image of just what exactly goes. Yeah. It, it's just it's it's incredible. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have a uh, you know we'll uh, if if anybody has any questions. Um, feel free to enter them in the chat or uh, you can, you're more than welcome to take yourself off mute and ask Danny yourself. Um, I have a few questions to get us going. Um, if folks wanna uh, wait a few, oh, I see, ooh, hand. Um, Juan, would you like to kick us off with the question? Yeah, uh, first, uh, Danny, thank you for um, for that talk. Uh, I'm. I love the work, and I, I wanted to uh, start with a question on uh, those uh, spaces of absence in language, mm -hmm. because I, I, I mean, I studied Spanish and, and uh, also art, and I know the archives, yes, they are spaces in which there is emptiness, and I wanted to ask you if you thought also of that as constructing that space that is not present in Latin America in, in itself, because I'm I I come from Venezuela. I don't see this being discovered in an archive in Venezuela. Like there's no way there's like like machismo would have right. let let a business uh, even in a little you know space, a little mm -hmm. publication, be appearing. So. Uh, I want. I wondered about that, about like fulfilling that historical space too. Um, it's definitely not something that I thought about in particular, but it could definitely play into that. Yeah, I mean, thinking about um, machismo just in in like Chicano culture is is something that is definitely um, 
something that I think about and that I that I has affected me, of course, um, just growing up in Southern California in, a, in an extremely um, kind of macho, homophobic environment. Um, but it's not it's not definitely something that I that I thought about in terms of Latin America. I was really trying to kind of make in in that with that gesture trying to speak to maybe myself in in a past in a past right so like making an object now that can speak to the sort of former self seeing making what I would want like what what I would have wanted to see um when I was there and um I just thought that language was uh, interesting way of doing it because it's um, I I I originally started by looking for actual images of of um, um, Latino queers in the archive, and you know that that's that was fine, um, but I just didn't think that it was as playful as it didn't give me the the liberty that that language um, allowed. Um, so that was really kind of where I was I was thinking about is thinking about addressing a subject that that could have benefited from seeing them yeah if that makes sense thank you mm -hmm. uh well i have a question for you danny um we've uh, i know with the studio visits and then just working with you throughout the cola process um we talked a lot about the importance of Los Angeles and Los Angeles's history. And uh, you touched on it a little bit in your talk, but uh, could you speak a little bit more about why Los Angeles and Los Angeles's history is just an important point of reference for you in your work? Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's always been kind of a, a subject in my work in, in either direct ways or roundabout ways. Um, and in this particular case, um, I, the, the story that gets told, um, the national story that gets told about the gay rights movement is it's always New York centric and nothing against New York, um, but that's kind of where it starts, right? Stonewall. Um, Stonewall is the sort of beginning point. And, um, I just know that that's not true. Uh, I know that the Black Cat riots happened two years prior to, to Stonewall. I know that a lot of the, uh, the major gay rights organizations that started in the 60s started in Los Angeles and in San Francisco and California in general. So there's this whole like West Coast uh, erasure that happens um, when, when these stories get told about, about the gay rights movement in the United States. So, and that that then by proxy then is about thinking about um, telling invisible histories, which is what I've always been interested in, whether it's uh, Los Angeles's uh, invisible history or whether it's Latinx queers invisible history like that has always just been interested to, interesting to me. And then in particular, I, um, I kind of went down this road when um, I was living in Silver Lake. And I had chosen to live in Silver Lake. I, I went to graduate school in San Diego and moved back to LA um, after graduate school. And I particularly chose to live in Silver Lake because of its history of being a mix of, um, of Latino immigrant families, um, you know, Japanese Americans, and then that it was a, a historically gay neighborhood. Um, and as I lived there, um, I had already, I was, you know, part of the gentrification, I guess you can say, but by the time I moved there, I was already seeing it change. And then within the 15 years that I lived there, it went completely from being a very prominent and visibly gay neighborhood to, to being completely um, gone. Um, so much so that we had a neighbor um, moved in at the time that was um, surprised. She said that she got she got hit on by by a woman at a bar and she was very surprised. And I, and I told her, well, why are you surprised? This is a gay neighborhood. And she said, no, it's not. Like she just had no idea that that she was living in what was once a gay neighborhood. Um, so that that really um struck me as as like this neighborhood has lost its identity. Um, and there was um, you know, it had one of the largest concentrations of bathhouses 
um, in, in LA. Uh, and to me, those spaces always seemed as like um, radical spaces where, where, where men were, were redefining kind of um, love and sex and relationships. And I was just sort of seeing it disappear. And so that just became kind of a natural connection to me is, is to want to tell that, that space that, and that story. Thank you. Oh, I see a hand up. Um, I was thinking about, um, you know, the, the where people appear and where they don't. And, you know, especially that tension of all of the kind of fragments that you're working on and, you know, things that you can't see. It's archaeological remains and things in archives. And that it seemed, I think, most or all of the human figures come from those advertisements. Yeah. And I just, I don't know, I'm just curious to hear you talk a little bit more about, like, what that does to have those human figures there and how you think about what the role of that, I mean, the sort of, there's like that tension of, you know, just what you were talking about, this sort of human element to the intimacy of these unseen or abstract or fragmented histories. Um, yeah. So just to hear you reflect on that a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, working with the figures was really weird for me because I've always been, um, for the last 15, almost 20 years, I've just been working abstractly, um, geometric abstraction, really, literally working with space and architecture. So, to then come to a figure was very strange. Um, and the, the way that, the only way that I can think of, or the way that I'd been thinking about it, and I don't know if this answers your question, but it, it, the way that I'd been thinking about it is, is literally thinking about them as ghosts um, and thinking about as these ghosts that are trapped in the archive. Um, so thinking about the archive as this, as this, um, as a stult stultifying kind of container and that what I was trying to do is sort of release them, release them from, from that archive and from that trap. Um, so that was the way that I kept thinking also about brujeria and like witchcraft is that, that that's what kept coming to me is that it's like they're ghosts that are trapped there and I want to get them out. Um, and then the advert, yeah, I mean, the fact that there were advertisements, I mean, the, the thing that I just always find interesting is that you see a connection in the books between like literally after after Stonewall, all of a sudden you start seeing these advertisements. Um, so you see the the relationship between um, capitalism and the gay dollar, right? So you see it kind of um, growing um, in that period between Stonewall and the AIDS crisis. So it, it kind of swells in, in that in that time period. And that's when you start seeing these more explicit ads that 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 um, that they started using for bathhouses, um, and you know clearly it's about desire and 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 attractiveness and and all of that. Um, so it just, but yeah, the figures are are, a they're they're odd, they're odd for me. Oh, I don't think they're odd. I was just. I curious. mean, for me, they are. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting that the. The source imagery is all, you know, it's drawings, it's line drawings. It's not, they're not photographs, right? They're not, right. they're anonymous also. Right. All right. right. Yeah. Yeah. JB. Hi, Danny. Hi. Um, first, uh, well, I have a comment and a question. And so my comment first is, um, is just to say how much I appreciate your like narrating the story of the creation and, and kind of highlighting some of what were kind of failures, right? <laughs> um, as someone who fails all of the time, um, I, I, I really appreciate that, um, that kind of story. Um, my question is, um, is about how you, um, you've been creating monuments in a moment when monuments are being toppled all yeah. over the place, right? And I'm wondering about how that context may have informed um, your decisions about how and when to create monuments. Mm. Yeah, I. that's interesting. Um, I mean, I've always been interested in, 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 well, okay, in the same way that 
I've made drawings of architecture and of buildings, and my interest isn't really in the buildings and isn't in, in really in, in, in architecture. It's that that's, it's a proxy to talk about the public space, right? It's a, it's a proxy to talk about, um, um, to talk about uh, public history, right? Um, so in a similar way, I think memorials, I've always been interested in memorials and, and have um, made drawings, like the early work that I was doing in 2010, I thought of as sort of abandoned uh, memorials um, and, and, and thinking about the way that a memorial serves, it's supposed to serve to commemorate, um, to remember. Um, it's sort of a, a, a mark in space and time, you know, for, for a particular story. But then it's also to think about, um, well, what gets a memorial and what doesn't? What gets a monument and what doesn't, right? And, and that's sort of like, the way that I thought about about the work um, is that that I'm in, on one hand was creating um, memorials and monuments that that I wanted to see. Um, so yeah, I don't know in terms of like I, I can tell you that that I and I don't know if this answers your question either, but I can tell you that I'm I've I'm uncomfortable with the way that the discourse around monuments in this country has occurred. Um, I'm I'm a, a believer that that the monuments that have been toppled and taken taken down that that's actually the wrong move. Um, I think that that the right move would be to um, intervene in some way in the monument um, because then it's it's just another form of erasure. They were just sort of forgetting that we once had a monument to sort of a racist white supremacist. And, and then how do we then advance from that? I would much rather see uh, an artistic intervention in, in those monuments in the way that I think sometimes uh, makeshift memorials do, right? Um, thinking about uh, maybe even some of the George Floyd like memorials and monuments, um, the way that artists can intervene in these the monuments so that you, see, you have the original, so they have a context um, but then there's a critical intervention in them. And, and maybe that's the way that I'm thinking about monuments is, is really is, is more of a, a critical intervention and, and not just a, a passive acceptance of what monuments are supposed to do. Because I think they're very problematic um, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so I don't know if that gets to it a little bit. Thank you, Danny. Uh, there's a question in the chat um, or a comment question um, from Sammy. It's a congratulations on the work. Are you planning to exhibit the virtual art pieces in the metaverse? Um, that's not something that I've thought about necessarily. Uh, I like, I think that there is a, a tension that exists um, where you're seeing the images in, 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 in real life, but that they only exist in virtual and that, that, that kind of play between what is, what's in the real world and what is not is, is kind of interesting. So just putting it in the metaverse, um, I, yeah, I haven't thought about it, but, but I like this idea of it existing and slipping in and out of um, the real and the virtual. Um, I'm exploring um, 3D printing with some of them. And so that seems kind of interesting because there's this tension again between um, making, making a, 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 a virtual imaginary object, making it real. Um, these are images. So there's, a, I don't know, there's just something more interesting to me about that, that I haven't thought about the metaverse necessarily. Um, I, I wouldn't say no, though, I guess, if there's the right context for it. Great. Thank you. And I, I think you, you touched on the uh, last question I was going to ask you, which is just what are you uh, what are you really excited to continue working on with this with this new work? And if you could just whatever you feel comfortable sharing with uh, yeah. yeah, next steps and all that. So I, at this point, I'm just making a lot more. I feel like the, the process opened up a lot of possibilities for 
um, making stuff and I'm having a lot of fun making it. Um, so I'm just going to keep making more. Like I said, I want to explore 3D printing and, and see what the possibility is there in terms of um, bringing them out of the virtual space and into the real space. Um, I'm also working on a, on a related but, but separate project called Watch Queen, which takes the uh, Laud Humphreys um, studies and, and creates a video narrative out of it. So I'm, I'm creating, taking those maps and creating um, imaginary ruins that are based off of his maps of, of the, the bathhouses. And then um, using video game software, I'm creating these, these massive worlds that, I, that I'm then filming and then have voiceover narration that, that basically tells the story of, um, of Laud Humphreys and his, and his sort of observations. So that's a project that is in, in, in progress. Um, it's another software program that I had to learn. So it's, it's, been, it's been quite challenging, but with these, I'm just gonna keep making them because they're kind of fun. Um, and I keep finding, I have a whole collection of, of um, archival documents that I found um, that I just keep getting new ideas for. And so, yeah, that's what I'll be working on. Great, I just, uh, I know when we spoke earlier this week, I loved your comment about just how you're, you're looking at what you're seeing in your daily life and you're just like already picturing how to render it. Oh yeah. yeah. I was driving down the freeway and there was like a boulder on the, on the side of the road. And like, I just kept wanting to click it and have little like arrows that could move it. But, I, but I, cause I was so in that like space that everything seemed like clickable. And that's when I thought, okay, I have to take a break. This is, like, <laughs> it's getting too weird. You know? Well, um, uh... I, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, let me just make sure nobody has a hand up. Nope, I'm not seeing any hands up, but um, does anybody else have any other questions for, for Danny or going once, twice? Cool, well, I think we can, uh, we can end it here. Um, Danny, thank you so much for just, just the really just fantastic, work and talk um you you're just incredibly generous and um just it's really it's really just uh mentioned it before but it's really been a honor and privilege to be able to work with you and to see your work um up close as you've been uh creating it for for cola and beyond so just uh thank you so much um i'll also just danny was also very generous and um sent or shared a few resources um that we just uh, put in the chat. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more or um, you know, help get inside Danny's head a little bit more with the inspiration, uh, feel free to copy that, but we'll also be sure to send that out as well as a link to the recording as soon as it's available. And a big thank you to JB who introduced me to Sadia Hartman, which was, yeah. I, I'm just, so amazing and right up my alley so yeah thank you jb <laughs> <laughs> well and um i just i also just want to thank um our uh, stephanie um who's also part of the little mag team here today and then also just the department on disability hillary nicole cindy thank you so much for being here and um providing the sign language interpreting services and live captioning um it's always a pleasure to work with the department on disability and uh, i think uh yeah i think we can wrap it up here so thank you so much everyone and um for being here and uh stay tuned for more i'm gonna stop recording now thanks everyone yeah Where's the question? Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>